there's somebody up there? You know, God started man off and he gave man a garden home. That garden home had an entrance way. Why was there an entrance? You know, when we have a look at the entrance of sin, God had to place an angel at the gate to the garden to guard the way to the tree of life. God wants us to come back to Him and to focus on His plan to bring us to be at one with God again. No more separation, just beautiful harmony, peace, joy, love. Isn't that what you want? A good life? A good future? It's never nice being on the outside. You know, we always want to know what's going on inside. We want to be able to be inside the gates, inside the walls. You know, God doesn't want us to be outside either. And so He had a plan to get us back into that garden home. Sometimes man tries to sort out his own problems, but it never really comes to anything good. God has a better way and a better plan. A plan for you and a plan for me. Enjoy the message. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are your people because we claim you as our God. And Father, you say that you will be our God and that we will be your people. And Father, as we come before you this day, we pray that we may receive a rich blessing that you have prepared for each one of us. That as we read your word, as we open your word, as we look upon the pages of holy writ, that we may richly be blessed from the assurance of salvation and the gift that you've given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. May each person be blessed, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. The mystery of salvation. The message this morning is called The Tale of Two Trees. It's a favorite message that I have, but I want to read as we begin from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Verses 8 down to verse 10, the Bible says, For by the grace of God are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God talks about these things that were before ordained. They were prepared beforehand. In the same book, if you turn across to chapter 3 in Ephesians and begin also in chapter eight, uh, verse 8 of chapter 3, he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. He talks about the mystery that was hidden. The mystery that was unknown, but becomes known in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You know, really there's many things that we're not going to understand until we sit at that marriage supper of the Lamb and we can ask the Lamb himself, why did this happen? Why did that happen? There's so many mysteries even about life that we don't understand that only God can give us. And when he gives us the answer, we'll see the wisdom of God. We'll understand the workings of God. You know, when we look about this mystery, this eternal purpose that God purposed within himself, what was this thing that he really purposed? 
this mystery that he had, is really the plan of salvation, the most greatest theme that the mind can contemplate. What is the plan of salvation? How does God outline that plan? It is outlined in the sanctuary service. The whole sacrificial system that God had to bring man back into harmony with God. We know that Moses built a tabernacle. And they sacrificed animals and they worshipped God according to the instructions that God had given. Now when you think about this sanctuary service, if I was to ask you the question, what is your favorite part of the sanctuary? I mean, you could look inside the building. Remember, there was the courtyard, and they had the altar, and they had the laver, and then there was another uh, apartment that was cut into two pieces, the holy place and the most holy, with the candlesticks and the showbread and the altar of incense, and finally the ark of the covenant. What is your favorite part? Did you like the bread? Maybe you like to eat. Do you like the candlesticks? You know, so we might have different parts that, that we all prefer, but how about when I say, and you, when you look at the service of the sanctuary, what aspect or facet of the service of the sanctuary is your favorite part? I mean, if I was to say, would you enjoy the part where you had to sacrifice a lamb? Whether you say, well, that's my favorite part. It's not something that, that I would find enjoyable. You know, that's why Paul, when writing to the Colossians, he said that which was against us, that which was contrary to us, that law that Christ took away and nailed to the cross. So that certainly wouldn't be my favorite part. If I was to say, what is my most favorite part of the sanctuary, I would be looking into the most holy place. Why? Because that's where God dwells. And when I look into the holy place and I see the service in the holy place, we have that part of the service known as the atonement. But we know when we look at the atonement, we can break it down and say the at one mint. Meaning the process of being at one with God. You know, there was a time before when man was at one with God. Well, where was man at one with God? It wasn't during the time of Noah and the flood. We know that Noah was a righteous man, but the world was full of wickedness. We need to go right back to the beginning and get back to the Garden of Eden. When man was at one with God. Now, when you think back to that garden, that beautiful garden, what is the Garden of Eden? You know, does the word paradise... Would I be going outside the, the, the realms of description to say Eden would have been a paradise? You know, when you think about a paradise, what does a paradise look like? Would it be fair to say that possibly a paradise has some palm trees? Anyone like palm trees? If you have a palm tree in your front lawn, it costs a bit of money. If you want one in your front lawn, it costs a lot of money especially if you want a, a big one. People like palm trees. There's something restful about palm trees. There's something tropical about palm trees. But really, what was Eden like? What was it like in the Garden of Eden? I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll read in Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. What was the Garden of Eden like? Beginning in verse 8, going down to verse 10, the Bible tells us about the Garden of Eden. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Here we find this beautiful paradise location called Eden. God planted the garden. There's plenty of water there. It's a beautiful place. We find that there is the tree of the knowledge of good and 
and of evil. Unfortunately, sin separates us from God. And so, you know, if I was to take my Bible and say, you know, we have a look at the beginning, in the first little bit, and that's where we have God started man off on the right foot. But then if I go across to the other end and we turn our Bibles across to the book of Revelation, and we turn across to Revelation chapter 21, and this is what the Bible says beginning in verse 3. You're familiar with this passage. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God is true and faithful. Those words that we read are true and faithful. I want you to have a look there in Revelation 21 and have a look at the description of what it's going to be like. He says there in verse 1, uh, verse 3 rather, And I heard a great voice out of heaven, Behold the tabernacle. God is going to dwell with man. We find the atonement. We are now at one with God again. Verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's no more tears. There shall be no more death. You know, if there is no more death, what do you have? Remembering this because do you remember the Bible says in the previous chapter, chapter 20, the Bible says that God is going to destroy death. And so God takes death and he throws it into the lake of fire, the Bible says. How do you destroy death? You destroy death with life. God promises us life. God will give us Life. He destroys death with life. There's no more death because there is only going to be life, eternal life. He goes on and says, there shall be no more crying. There's going to be happiness and joy. And then he says, there'll be no more pain. You know, really, if there's no more pain, could you say there might be pleasure? Do you like the word pleasure? It's pleasing. There'll be pleasure as opposed to pain. Now, what does Eden mean? We're talking about the Garden of Eden. What does the word Eden mean? Does it mean paradise? Do you know what Eden means? The word Eden in the Hebrew means pleasure. Did you know that? God made a garden, and he called the garden pleasure. And in the garden, there was life. There was no death. In the garden, there was joy and happiness. There was no sorrow nor crying. You know, so really, when I have a look at my Bible, and I take that place in Genesis 1 and 2, and then I get down to Revelation 21 and 22, and I look at all the stuff in the middle... All this stuff here, this unnecessary thing because of sin. God started man off in a place of pleasure, in a place of life, with joy and happiness. God wants to finish man off into a place of pleasure, of joy, of life and happiness. Unfortunately, we have this big piece in the middle that God never intended on. God never planned for this, but he was prepared in case it happened. This whole thing of sin, this whole thing we have here in Holy Writ, is God's plan being fulfilled in the lives of man to bring us to be at one with our Creator. A garden home. You know, what was Eden? God wants to restore us back to Eden. 
Eden restored. How do we get back? I mean, how do we get back? We want to get back to Eden. How do we get back? Let's have a closer look to Eden. What was Eden? Eden was a, a garden. It was a garden home. Sometimes we have a garden at our home, but this was a garden home that Adam and Eve lived in. What is a garden? Now you're thinking when I say what is a garden, you might be thinking tomatoes and, and, and cucumbers and lettuce and celery and anything else you want to grow and maybe potatoes and carrots, and you're thinking a garden. What is a garden? What does garden mean in the Hebrew? In the Hebrew language... The word garden means enclosure. It's the word gan. It means a fenced enclosure. Have you ever heard the term a secret garden? A secret garden? A garden with an enclosure around it. This was man's first home. Now if we have a garden enclosure, we've got to think there's one question. It's enclosed. So the question is, how do you get in? You know, if you have a garden, the word garden means enclosure. You need to have a way to get in. You need a gate or an entrance into the garden. Now, did Eden have an entrance? Because Eden, it was the garden of Eden, the enclosure of pleasure. A home, a garden home. But how did they get in? Was there a gate or an entrance? Look in Genesis chapter 3 again. This time look at verse 24. The Bible tells us that unfortunately after sin, God had to take measures and set an angel at the garden. The Bible says there, chapter 3 and verse 24, the Bible says, So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of God life. So if there's a wall around there, the entrance must be at the east. Because if there was an entrance at the west or the north or the south, God would have to place an angel here. But here we find the angel is placed at the east. Why? Because that's where the entrance to the enclosure is found. If the garden has an east, it's an enclosure. It also has a north, a south, and a west. That's just geographically correct. Now, remember in the garden, there were two trees of significance. There were many trees. But there were two trees that everybody knows the name of those two trees. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, it tells us the location of these two trees. Read with me again in chapter three, uh, chapter 2 rather, and verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil evil. Two trees. Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now have a look at chapter 3 and verse 3 because we find the same description is given. But of the fruit, of the tree which is in the where? The midst of the garden. Ye shall not, what? Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye Die. Where was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was in the midst of the garden. What does the midst mean? It kind of means the middle, isn't it? Where we get the word midst. In the middle. But then Genesis 2 9 says that the tree of life was also in the middle. So were the trees somewhat together? 
like this. Side by side, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Now, if you were meant to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but it's right by the tree of life, but you're allowed to go to the tree of life, it's kind of strange, isn't it, if you say, don't go here, but you can go here. Now, I started thinking about this, and I thought, can you have two midsts? Can you have two middles? Now, if I was to cut my garden enclosure in half, we would soon find that it's quite easy to have two midsts. You have the midst at one end, and then you have the midst at the other end. You can have two trees that are separated. They are both in the midst of the garden, but they are not side by side. Simple, isn't it? Now, when you think about it, let's move on, because what does the sanctuary do? The sanctuary brings us back to God. Now, what did the sanctuary look at? Let's forget this at the moment. What did the sanctuary look like? Well, actually, before I mention that, I will come on, I will come on here a little bit. We had the tree of life on one end, the tree of death on the other end, both in the middle of the garden. Now, what does the sanctuary look like? We've looked at the Garden of Eden, this enclosure. Now we're going to look back to the sanctuary. How many sanctuaries have there been? How many tabernacles? According to the Jewish encyclopedia, there's been six of them. They put the first one as being Moses' wilderness sanctuary, the one they built uh, 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 in the second year of the Exodus. There was a tabernacle at Shiloh. You read about it in Joshua chapter 18 and verse 1, and this is the one that Joshua set up, the same tent that they would have had, but he set it up in Shiloh, and so they would go to Shiloh. We find that they talk about the tabernacle of Nod. This was one for the priests. There was a tabernacle of Gibeon. That's in 2 Chronicles 1.3. There was Solomon's temple. You know, it's always interesting. interesting. Solomon's temple was meant to be a, a house called after God's name. But it was called Solomon's temple. That was built in the year 957 B.C., but it was destroyed in 586 B.C. Then a number of years later, in 352 B.C., they built the second temple, as they call it. The one that Christ walked into. The one that the old man wept because it wasn't as beautiful as the original one. This was the one that was destroyed by Titus in 70 A.D., but, you know, I really say there's a seventh sanctuary, a seventh tabernacle, a seventh temple that the Bible talks about, that Paul speaks about, and that is the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly tabernacle that we read about in the book of Hebrews. Now, remember that the sanctuary service contains the plan of salvation given by God. God calls us to keep His commandments. Turn your Bible across to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. And I want to have a look. Matthew chapter 19. And I want to look at verse 17. The Bible talks about a young man who came to Christ and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him in verse 17, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. We find the same thing in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, it says, keep the commandments. You know, Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. Sharing the same principle. But I love the way Jesus puts it. If you love me, he puts the service of love first. The obedience is not a way of salvation. It is the fruit of salvation. It is the service of a heart that is returning love to God for love received. Is what God gives to us. Now, it wouldn't be fair to mention this without uplifting Christ in a real way. I want you to turn your Bible across to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and looking at verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and looking at verse 9. The Bible says, chapter 8, verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He took our place, that we might have his place. He's offering us his place, that he might take our place. You know, I love that verse. What Christ has offered for us. And he offered this through the sanctuary service because he was that lamb that symbolized the sacrifice that he was to make. Now when we take a look at the sanctuary on the screen here, we know the sanctuary was this enclosure that had different aspects in there. It had an east side Now we know on the east side of the sanctuary was different to the other sides because on the east, as opposed to the north, the south, and the west, there was an entrance. So the sanctuary was entered from the east side. If we change the perspective, let's flatten it. The sanctuary had an aspect to do with death. The altar of sacrifice, where the lamb that was slain was placed and consumed. We know this symbolized the cross. This is Christ giving his life for you and for me. And as you went down through the sanctuary, once you'd come past the cross, the next part in the service brought us to life that we might be partakers of the tree of life. Now the sanctuary... (coughs) What did the sanctuary look like on the inside? That's just a little bit of an overview that we've looked at on the outside. But what did it look like on the inside? I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 6. What did the sanctuary look like on the inside when they built these temples and these tabernacles? 1 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to have a look beginning, uh, looking at verse 29. We know it had four sides. It had an entrance. It's a way to lead back to the tree of life. Is that correct? The sanctuary, sin leads us away from God. The sanctuary brings us back to God, to put us back in harmony with God. The Bible says this is what it looked like on the inside. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 29, the Bible says, And he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims. So here we find inside the temple which was the sanctuary, on the inside, carved on the walls, you could see angels. Sounds like a heavenly place, doesn't it? Somewhere where angels love to dwell. Let's read on. And palm trees. And open flowers within and without. Inside the sanctuary looks like a 
paradise. We've got palm trees and flowers and angels. It's a lovely place inside the sanctuary. We find the same description is also given in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 41 and verse 18. It says that there was palm trees and angels and flowers inside the sanctuary. Had you ever pictured the sanctuary being so beautiful? So often we look and we see this tent on the outside and we think it was pretty plain and boring. Or we see a big stone temple and we just think of stones and we know, well, there's lots of gold there. And so we just think about gold walls, which would probably get boring after a while. But here you have carved into it, you've got angels and palms and open flowers, a paradise setting, a paradise scene. Like a garden. Now if I was to ask the question, what is a tabernacle? What is the temple? We know the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, God said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Remember we read there in Revelation 21 and verse 4, verse 3 rather, God says that he wants to dwell with us. The tabernacle of God is with man and he will dwell with them. The place where you dwell, the place where you live is your home. Here God also has a garden-themed home. Inside the sanctuary, it looks like a garden home. Now, if you've ever gone somewhere, let's say we go outside, so I go outside. In order to get back inside, I need to do the reverse of when I came out. I go back the opposite way. Now, keep that in mind and look at the screen. When we look at the sanctuary, it can be broken up into two halves. Each half has a midst, a center, right in the middle there. A little bit like the Garden of Eden, a tree of life in the middle of one end, and a tree of death, the knowledge of good and evil, in the middle of the other end. The sanctuary had an aspect to do with life in one end and death in the other end. Same as in the garden. Tree of life in one end, tree of death, in the other end. Both the sanctuary and the Garden of Eden were enclosures. Both the sanctuary and the Garden of Eden had an entrance on the east side. We started off with the gift of life in the garden. Unfortunately, because of sin, man came to death and went outside the garden. But then God came up with a plan. He says, I can bring you back into the garden. It's back the other way. The only way back to life is through death. The death of Jesus Christ. Christ's ministry had two phases. It had a phase of life because he lived the life that we need to live. And it had a phase of death he lived the death that we deserve to die. For us, the opposite is true. Death brings life. Our life has brought death to Christ. Christ's death brings life to us and reinstates us back into favor and into communion with God the Father. Jesus died for our sins but the death that he died could not hold him because he never sinned. Death was a penalty for sin, but he had not. So he was able to come to life again. I want you to turn your Bible across to the book of Deuteronomy, 
Deuteronomy chapter 11, looking at verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 11, looking at verse 26. The Bible says, Behold, I said before you, this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. A blessing and a curse. What side are you going to choose? Now what type of curse? What is a curse? Turn your Bible across to the book of Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to look down at verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. What does it mean by a curse? Galatians 3 and 13. The Bible tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. There was the curse of having to go through the sacrificial system. Christ became a curse for us because the Bible goes on and says, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ hung on a tree for us. There was a tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what was the altar made out of? The altar of sacrifice was made out of a tree. It was wooden overlaid with brass. You know, even at the other end, if we go into the most holy place, and we have the Ark of the Covenant was made from a tree overlaid with gold. You had a tree at either end in the sanctuary. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. What normally hangs on a tree, you would find the fruit. Is Christ somehow food? Because fruit is something you can eat. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He is the bread, he said, that came down from heaven. Christ is represented as being food to nourish, to sustain, to revive each one of us. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, talking on about the sanctuary as we find it in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19, the Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, And having a high priest over the house of God, speaking about Christ, it speaks about this veil that was in the tabernacle, and it says that it was his flesh. The flesh of Christ, this veil. Christ was the veil. We need to enter in through Christ. No man comes unto the Father but by me, is what Jesus says. There's nothing we can do. But hang on, you say. What does it say in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12? Turn your Bibles across to Philippians, just back a few pages. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says you've got to work it out yourself. Not meaning we have to find our own salvation, because verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
God wants to will and do in us. When he says work out your own salvation, he says understand the process. Here is God's plan. The sanctuary outlines the plan of salvation. In that sanctuary, as in the garden, the two trees, entrance on the same side, God's promise to us of salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Now, what came out of the sanctuary? When we look on the inside, the veil that was in there represents the flesh of Christ. What was on the veil? Turn your Bibles with me this morning across to Exodus chapter 36. Exodus chapter 36. And have a look. Verse 37, Exodus 36, verse 37, speaking about inside the tabernacle. And he made a hanging for the tabernacle door of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of needlework. Now look at verse 5, 35. And he made a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen with cherubims made he it of cunning work. This curtain was not plain. It had angels on the curtain. I would like to suggest, it doesn't say, but I would like to suggest that we're looking at three angels across the curtain. We find the three angels' message. The everlasting gospel is found in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Messages from three angels to bring us back into harmony with God. It says, worship God in the first angel's message. Turn away from sin and turn back to God. We have walked out of the way. He says, turn around and walk back in to the way because we have turned and walked away from God. I want to read from a book I found called The Desire of Ages. And this is what it says. At the cross of Calvary, love and selfishness stood face to face. Here was their crowning manifestation. Christ had lived only to comfort and bless. And in putting him to death, Satan manifested the malignity of his hatred against God. He made it evident that the real purpose of his rebellion was to dethrone God and destroy him through whom the love of God was shown. By the life and death of Christ, the thoughts of men also are brought to view. From the manger to the cross, the life of Jesus was a call to self-surrender and to fellowship and suffering. It unveiled the purposes of men. Jesus came with the truth of heaven, and all who were listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit were drawn to him. The worshippers of self belonged to Satan's kingdom. In their attitude towards Christ, all would show on which side they stood. And thus everyone passes judgment on himself. All those who were listening to the voice of Christ. Saying, turn and come back. The way in is the opposite of the way out. We went out to the east. We need to come back in through the sanctuary, which brings us back into communion with God. Revelation chapter 22. This is our last verse. Revelation chapter 22. And looking at verse 14. Revelation 22. Blessed are they that do his commandments. And they that may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. God has a tree of life in the city. 
He had a garden home. It had the tree of life. Man took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he was out of the garden. God had a plan that he went and put in place, the plan of salvation through the sanctuary to bring man back into harmony with God, that God may put man once again in a garden home. The sanctuary, the tabernacle of God, was a garden home with flowers and palms and angels. God's calling us to come home. He says, come home, I'm ready for you. God wants you and me to come home. The tale of two trees, the sanctuary of God. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we see and we know that you are coming soon. Father, we know that you have this plan that you put in place the reverse of sin, but you want to turn us from sin and turn us back to life. Father, we don't have life of ourselves, Lord. All we have is death. But Father, you have been willing to take that death from us that we may have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we pray that we may come closer to you, that you may perform a work in our lives to cleanse us and to change us that we may be like you, that you may reinstate us again into a garden home, a home where we have fellowship with angels, where we have fellowship, communion, and closeness with you again. Bless us, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed the message that you've just watched. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, or maybe there's other things you'd like to learn about, just feel free to contact us. You can call or you can text on 02111 85483 or just check out the website below.